we're up in the foothills and uh, behind me over there is Geneva and right behind me way over in the mountains is Mont Blanc but for us the key thing right now is just down there down there in the uh, valley is the Large Hadron Collider. It's a bit misty and of course the Large Hadron Collider is 100 meters underground so you can't actually see it but it's really nice to see the perspective of that life goes on above it. I think that's fantastic. Okay so a bit of geography. Um, we're looking due east and uh, what we can see is the the northernmost part of Geneva and uh, and then if we move further north sort of going northeast then you see the big expanse of, of the valley in that there and that's where the bulk of the ring is so in fact we can see most of this ring or, or we know where it is so we're in an absolutely ideal spot to try and get a perspective of the first of all the size of it right it's, it's just covering lots of little villages going around and then just the thought that uh, there's these particles whizzing around there close to the speed of light within about three meters per second of the speed of light you know not much slower than walking pace of the speed of light and the Large Hadron Collider is this 27 kilometer ring deep underground 100 meters underground and uh, that's where we fire protons in both directions they're just going around and hitting in four different places and uh, with a bit of luck we'll be visiting two of them in the next uh, day or so and that's where we do our fundamental particle physics it's where we're trying to understand the building blocks of the universe it's a shutdown at the moment they shut down just after just after before christmas in fact uh, to do upgrades because they're constantly developing the detectors they've got new ideas putting in new bits of kit, checking things out, checking the accelerator itself out, checking all the software. It was built uh, commissioned, uh, built in 1989. The actual um, tunnel uh, in which the Large Hadron Collider uh, is now placed, and it was built for another large uh, accelerator called LEP, which is the Large Electron Positron Accelerator. So that, large because it's so big, 27 kilometers, and Electron Positron, they fired electrons and, and the, its antiparticle, the positron, again in opposite directions and collided them in a series of uh, detectors. And that ran through until about 2000 uh, when they decided now was the time to decommission it and move up in energy scales, uh, move up to uh, use protons, uh, and which is the Large Hadron Collider. The Hadron in Large Hadron Collider represents the fact that you're dealing with protons because protons are hadrons and electrons are leptons. This famous tunnel and famous ring wasn't even built for the Large Hadron no, Collider. No, it wasn't built for it. It was, it was built for this other. But, and, and the, the, but the, it became economically, you know, it, just imagine, you, you, again, you just need to look down there and see. Imagine you decided to build another ring. <laughs> that, that, that 27 kilometer ring wasn't the one you wanted and you wanted another one, an even bigger one. You know, the disruption it would cause, the expense it would cause. And uh, they did a lot of research, you know, it wasn't that the, the, the ring which uh, was built, you know, it's just opened in 2009, was, was built, devised in 2008. Back in the 1980s, people began to talk about it. And so they worked out that actually they could use this 27-kilometer uh, ring of, the, of, the, of LEP. And by having powerful enough magnets, that's the, cru that's the crucial thing, by having new powerful magnets, they could actually get the protons to the kind of energies that you need in order to uh, re hopefully uh, reconstruct the Higgs. You're not telling me the LHC was built on the cheap. It wasn't built on the cheap, no. We're talking billions of euros, billions of dollars, billions of pounds to uh, build it. Get some protons and uh, get some more protons. And, and First to, to thing to note about the protons is they're composite objects. Unlike LEP, LEP was the large electron-positron collider. The electron and the positron are fundamental particles. The idea is they're not made of anything else. They, there is nothing else inside them, unless you believe in string theory and they've they're, they're, uh, got strings in, but in, it, up to now they're perfectly fine as fundamental objects. Protons aren't, right? Protons have got three quarks in each proton and eight gluons, all f smashing together inside the proton. So they're composite. So here's two of them. So if you've got two composite objects, 
you bring them together, what do you get? Smash! Lots of stuff coming out, okay? You, into my, you got it on your face. Into my eye and everything. <laughs> you got a <laughs> you muon see? in your eye. I got a muon. That, went, that would have gone straight through. <laughs> so the, uh, you, you produce lots of things. Oh, that's lovely. There are only quarks and gluons coming into the car crash. Mm. But there are things coming out of the car crash that aren't quarks and gluons. Yeah, it's amazing. It's all thanks to Einstein. <laughs> you know, Einstein told us that um, the, 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 you could convert mass and energy. You could think of them as being the same thing. It's probably the most famous equation of all time, E equals MC squared. And so indeed, the idea is you have the, the effectively the, the energy of the incoming uh, quarks and gluons, which are in the protons. So the energy of the incoming protons, that, that energy can then get redistributed. It doesn't just have to go back out into the same set of quarks and, and, and uh, gluons. It can, in fact, create, be create, if you can create enough of it, if there's enough of it, you can create a particle of that required mass, you know, E equals mc squared. And if that energy is high enough, you can create a high enough massive particle. But the, the, the key thing is it, that even though the majority of the stuff is, is probably the neutrons and the protons and the quarks all recombining together and producing what are known as showers or jets, um, you do get occasionally the Higgs. But it is occasionally. So for an example of, of how difficult it is and how amazing this whole thing is and the analysis that these guys are doing, um, in one particular regime where the Higgs could be produced, you actually would get one Higgs in every 10 trillion events. That sounds like you'll never get any Higgs. But re remember, you've got, a, you've got um, up to uh, a billion events a second, collisions a second happening. It actually means that you could get a Higgs maybe once every three hours or so of the experiment. But that's still massive, right? It's very rare to get these Higgs. And then you've got to think about how you're going to uh, determine that you've got it because it decays. And that's part of the big issue. But the majority of the stuff that comes out is, as you say, you know, known physics. It's jets and... And so one of the big things that they have to do, one of the most important things that they have to do in these detectors is have a trigger system. They have to have a mechanism by which they can decide whether or not an event is useful or not, given all the billions that are shooting out every second. How does all that energy decide, OK, I'm going to reconstitute into a Higgs boson today, or today I'm going to reconstitute back into the quark I first came from. How does the energy decide? And if the energy is deciding what to reconstitute into, why isn't it always reconstituting into the same thing? Yeah, so because the energy doesn't decide. Um, the, it's all on statistics. Uh, basically, it's, it's not that everything's equally probable. It's, m it's much easier to do some things than do other things. It's much easier for me to walk along a road than go down one of these black runs here without falling down. And, and the chances of, so what happens is the majority of the time, everything does what it's easiest to do. And that's why, for example, the Higgs is only appearing in one ev in every trillion or so events, uh, which can also produce the Z boson. It's that particular decay mechanism, the Higgs decays to the Z, which then decays to some leptons. But that process, of, of the Higgs doing that will only occur in one in every trillion events. The, 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 the collision energy is much more likely to be redistributed in other sets. And you can work out, that's the beauty of this, that Feynman provided it with a mechanism to work using what's known as perturbation theory. Um, he provided us with a mechanism to calculate the probabilities of these various decay routes. Uh, uh, so from a given particle, where is it likely to decay to? This is the one that's going to get the Higgs. Hadron uh, reflects the fact the type of particles that are being fired around the ring. There are, we classify fundamental particles into two kind of uh, t uh, two, two regimes depending upon their differences, simply whether or not they experience the strong force. And uh, if they don't experience the strong force, then they're, they're, they're part of the lepton family. 
if they do ex experience a strong force, in other words, if quarks are involved in, in, and gluons in, 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 in interactions, they're called hadrons. And uh, the hadrons themselves come in two types. Uh, mesons, which are made up of two quarks, a quark and an antiquark bound together. And then baryons, and we're made of the baryons, the protons and neutrons, and they're three quarks that bind together. Why don't they call it the Large Proton Collider? Because there are no other hadrons being collided. Thank you, Brady. Good question. <laughs> they're not just colliding the protons. There's another set of particles, which I'd forgotten to mention, which they're colliding, which are ions. And uh, so it's also, they, they, they're, taking very he they're taking heavy ions and uh, firing them around as well. And they're, they're, pro they're full of protons and, and neutrons. And so you can't just call them uh, the large proton collider because they, they also, sometimes they take, they get rid of all the protons and then put these ions in and, and fire them around. And there they're trying to, we'll, we'll discuss this in a bit more detail later on, they're, they're trying to reconstruct the, uh, effectively what happens in the very early universe uh, what, and reconstruct what's something called the quark gluon plasma. For an, for an individual proton, you, you, you don't need such a huge machine, but you're, you're firing not one proton here. There's um, roughly uh, between 600 million and a billion collisions a second occurring. So you have to fire huge bunches of these. So in fact, at any one time, when the, when the beam is uh, up and running properly, um, there'll be of order 2,000, 2,300 2, bunches of particles going around in each direction, each bunch will have about a hundred billion protons in them. And you need a huge amount of energy to actually manage to do this, to get so many going around. Why does everyone call it the God particle? Oh, I hate that. I don't like that. Uh, I don't know where it was, who coined it, the God particle. Uh, it's just, it is the particle that people are trying to find. In some sense, the standard model isn't yet complete. Um, uh, it's got the particles that, we, that, that are in it, we've, we've found them, we've discovered them, but they, there's, we know that all these particles have different masses and the Higgs is the one that's needed to, to give the particles their masses and it hasn't been found. So you can't say the standard model is complete without the Higgs. And I think it's the fact that it's, if you like, the one missing particle, the particle that, that is seen as giving uh, mass to everything else led to it being coined the God particle. And, uh, it's got nothing to do with religion. You don't need God to have a Higgs. <laughs> You're a particle physicist. You have a tremendous interest in what happens here at yeah, CERN. Yeah. And you love talking about it. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever been to the Large Hadron Collider before? Uh, I've been to CERN. I've not been to the Large Hadron Collider as such. I've not been down any of the, uh, into any of the caverns. I'm so excited about it. It's frightening. Just going down in the cavern and I'm excited about it.